With the announcement of Death Stranding 2 and finally picking up a controller and playing the first game instead of endlessly doom scrolling YouTube shorts, I bring to you my magnum opus. Wait, I swear I left my script around here somewhere. Who stole my script for this video? What the actual F, guys? Come on. Now I'm gonna have to use this script that I found down the side of the sofa. It's my nighttime friend. My father doesn't really like gaming, but Hideo Kojima must have met him at some point and given him the sloppiest and sexiest night of his life because the entire time that I've known my dad, he's been a massive Metal Gear Solid fan. And that says a lot because my dad likes very few things and I'm not lucky enough to be one of them. That is a joke, but it does depend on what day you ask him. My dad likes the sneaky aspect of the gameplay. I used to think that was just because it reminded him of his many affairs, but it turns out the issue for gaming for him is that he can't use both hands simultaneously. So the slow paced combat of Metal Gear Solid gives his fingers some time to tickle Kojima on the upside down giblets and then get back to the game. Now, I grew up knowing quite a lot about Metal Gear Solid. My dad's a teacher and he'd spend a decent chunk of his time on holiday playing whatever the latest Metal Gear Solid game was. And I'd stand in the doorway not wanting to interrupt those few precious hours he could find away from me. And with all that being said, I do have a fondness for the series, even though I, to this day, have never played a single one. And I think that's a testament to me and my father's relationship. I learned to care so deeply about him, and he learned that if time travel existed, he'd go back to before I was born. Hideo Kojima, 1963, the 24th of August. That's when he was born. I thought I'd say it a bit weird because like it kind of keeps in theme with how Hideo Kojima writes things. Kojima started his career being anxious that he'd made the wrong move. People around him were unsupportive and wanted him to apply for a real job. It's just like telling your parents you want to be a YouTuber. Literally embarrassing for everyone involved. Unless you make it and you're bringing home the big money, then suddenly everyone's banging down your door telling you that they were your number one supporter from the beginning. And I will remember the people who wronged me. Look out. Check your post boxes. That's not a threat. I will have just handwritten you a note that states the exact location of a buried treasure, sending you on a months long escapade where at the end of it, you'll come to find that the treasure was inside of you all along. And I'd like to say that that's all a bit convoluted, but if I did, then there'd have to be some sort of comparison between... Now, as I've said, I've not played any of these games at the time of writing this script or even recording this video, but this video is about bringing you on a little personal journey. And, you know, it might fill that small void that you have from when your father left. And, you know, I am really sorry about that. It's not your fault. Now, what I do know about Metal Gear Solid is that, realistically, it reminds me a little bit of Kingdom Hearts. It's all very convoluted, and there's lots of characters that have the same name or are the same person or are clones of that said person. And then, all of a sudden, without warning, it becomes very Japanese. The series didn't start with Solid, though. It started with the simply titled Metal Gear. Now, I'm not sure if my dad ever played this one. I think he started with the first Metal Gear Solid on the PlayStation. So, for the sake of saving time, overall simplicity, and more importantly, my sanity, I'm only going to be talking vaguely about Solid, which was released in 1998. And that was two years before I was born, and two years before my father started turning grey. And his life flashed before his eyes. And so did Hideo Kojima. They have a really weird relationship. But the series was the start of something really big. There was one, two, three, four, five, and then he left. Sorry? No, what? Hang on. He left? No, that can't be right. No, okay, okay. We have skipped a little bit too far forward, so um, actually... In amongst what is understood to be a bit of a messy departure from Konami, Kojima started to work on a project with collaborator Guillermo del Toro, simply titled PT, or Playable Teaser. Now, I'm sure everyone knows about this by now, but it doesn't mean I don't still stay up at night wishing for a time where I could just boot up the PlayStation and feel something for once. This was possibly one of the greatest demos or teasers to ever be released, and I miss it dearly. The puzzles felt challenging, the atmosphere was absurd, and the scares felt genuinely scary. Walking through that house was like going to stay at my girlfriend's house and seeing her mum naked. I mean, like, I'm scared and confused, but I'd definitely go back for more. The teaser ends with Norman Reedus and the title being revealed as Silent Hills. Silent Hills! And that all got completely canned because they decided Kojima was a hack and Kojima decided Konami were idiots and he left it all behind. Now, I'm not sure if those details are completely correct and there will be people in the comments being like, well, that didn't happen like that and actually this and that. Well, I don't care. I don't care. It's my video. Why is everyone so horrible to me? 
Every video I feel like this happens. Anyway, that wasn't the end of the relationship for Kojima, Guillermo del Toro and Norman Reedus because next came... Finally, we're at the topic I actually wanted to talk about and we're gonna hit it hard. So lock up your mothers and your grandmothers because if you search my computer, it would suggest that I'm into anything ending in ilf. Which, I don't know how it happened, but someone must have gone on my computer. Which, you know, sounds unreasonable, but I learned that excuse from my best friend on holiday when I took his phone and, and he said the exact same thing to me. So, it's got to, it's got to work, right? That's a good excuse. No? Death Stranding had a chokehold on my backlog for a long time. It loomed in the back of my head like existential thoughts of the end of the world. And the gameplay I'd seen didn't appeal to me, but the cutscenes did the opposite. I was always on the fence about starting this game, but I was pushed off the fence into a bush of thorns by a system in which I call the wheel. Now, the wheel is simple. It has every game I have in my collection written onto a wheel. I spin the wheel and whatever game it lands on, I play until completion. Or at least until I get bored and decide that the game is better off to get dusty on my shelf. So, I did finally pop the game into my PlayStation 5, refused to pay the £5 to upgrade my version, and here we were, face first into the weirdest, best, and also the worst game I've ever played in my life. Cremation of the president's body is an insane way to start a game, but would I want it any other way? Definitely not, because when I started moving and realised that I physically had to hold up my character every time he walked, I did contemplate uninstalling. But I'm glad I didn't uninstall, because as you approach the cremation site, you're introduced to the main threat of the game, BTs. And not the, not the, like the, the internet provider, which, you know. This is where I started to find the PTBT spookiness that I was so longing for after playing PT. But then again, I really thought I'd enjoy rock climbing and I found myself in a situation akin to 127 hours and, and I can't get out. So please, please phone someone and send help because I'm stuck. I'm stuck here where I'm stood right now. Delivering the body to the cremation site feels like it should kick off this massive adventure and really set you on this epic quest, but if I'm really honest, it didn't, and it's a slow burn, and that usually doesn't work for me. I get way too bored, way too quickly. I can only stay hard for so long, and I feel myself going flaccid just thinking about it. And so really, for the next couple hours, I strapped on my big boy boots and got to walking. Literally everywhere. In a turn of events, something around this chapter actually happens in the game. You get sucked into a tornado, kind of Wizard of Oz style, and you get swept onto a battlefield with Hideo Kojima's man crush, Mad Mickelson, which does make my dad really jealous. Up to this point, you've been seeing flashbacks of your baby on your chest, um, like what they saw in the past or, or, or what you are assuming. You know, it, it, there's no context whatsoever. It's very confusing, but I need to bring it up now so that later on when I start talking about it, it's not, it's not just come out of nowhere. Does that make sense? Mads Mikkelsen is dressed in full army gear. Now, I'm pretty sure that he's only in this game, especially dressed the way he is, to kind of do some something for Hideo Kojima, which is a trend. It is a trend. I'll be honest, but really, is that an issue? It's Mads Mikkelsen and he's in army outfit. Stop complaining. I think at this point, you start to get glimpses of what the game might feel like later down the road, because I'll be honest, I'm still considering uninstalling it at this point, but there's something clinging you, you know, there's something dragging you through going, no, 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 wait, Please, please don't uninstall me, sir, please. And I'm glad I didn't. I'm, I'm glad I didn't. I don't bring this part of the game up because I think it's some sort of revolutionary chapter, but it definitely was the part of the game when you really start to realize something. Up to this point, you've been able to carry ladders, climb ropes, make bridges, and sometimes make a small piece of road. But it always feels a little bit incomplete. Something didn't always sit quite right with me about building all of those things, but around this point was when a weight was literally lifted off of my back. I mean, just as a side note, how the hell does Sam keep all of those things on his back? I understand he has like those robot leg things that, that help him, but seriously, that man... I don't know, he just gets, get, keeps getting back up and keeps going. 
Getting back on track, around this time is when you unlock PCC Level 2, which gives you an incredible item, the gigantic slingshot machine. You can zip, zap, and zoom around the map for a small price. Now, I started placing them everywhere I went and linking them up with other people's zip, zapping, zoomers, and boom, bam, and I was going everywhere, getting thousands of likes for my extraordinary placement of slingshots, and it started feeling like a collaborative effort. I started truly understanding and appreciating the mechanics of the game. It felt like I'd finally found the invitation to the sex party that everyone had been having for years. I felt accomplished. There's something about working together with strangers to create these mile-long paths that skip such tedious parts of the game. But without the tedium of the first chapters, the payoff would feel completely pointless. I was finally understanding why anyone would bother to complete this game. But to say that almost 10 hours in? Does that make it a good game? Because automatically I feel like that suggests that it cannot be a good game because I've had to endure 10 hours of bad game for it to start feeling like a good game. Well, okay, luckily the walking and all of that stuff isn't the only part of the game that I found fun. So maybe we'll reconsider after we talk about this next bit. This game is like if you've ever eaten strawberry ice cream and it's got the little bits of strawberry in it, like the actual little bits of strawberry. It's a nice little surprise that some people aren't going to appreciate and some people are actually going to hate, but an aficionado of strawberry ice cream like myself, I love a little bit of a, a fruity crunch. You know, just all of a sudden, mm, 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 frozen dish. I'm not saying that I'm better at enjoying things than you are, but I am certainly implying it. And like I said before, you need to suck it up and stop arguing with me in the comments because I will call the police for cyberbullying. I will do it. I'm not scared. There's a considerable amount of likable characters and interactions in this game. Dead man who gets in the shower with you. Fragile who I wish would get in the shower with you. Clifford Unger is such an interesting character shown to you so sparingly and with such purpose. But my favorite character in the whole game it has to be Troy Baker's Higgs. There's something so special about this late 80s emo, campy, like horror vibe that this guy gives. It makes me feel special. It's exactly how I would like to portray myself when I go outside. Like I want people to look at me and go, wow, that guy's really gay, but also emo spooky. You know, that's how me in this shirt. I mean, Troy Baker chose the goddamn scenery in this game. He's got such main character energy. He's completely evil, but somehow you still like him a little bit. He's literally trying to cause an end of the world event and pushed Fragile out into the rain to, to burn herself alive for like the ultimate trolley problem. And still I'm sat there going, wow, look how cool he is. And this is where Kojima's writing really shines in my opinion. Writing these characters that if given to somebody else would come across completely unlikable. But written by Kojima, he makes them fun to watch and a lot more than just like a simple villain. And that's what I think I really enjoyed about the writing and performances in this game. There's so much layer and depth to every scenario, every character, every interaction. It's not campy and fun for the sake of it. It always feels like it's there to lull you into a sense of security, to then hit you with the world's biggest, gooeyest Japanese boss battle. I mean, you fight the first boss from Kingdom Hearts in this game, but instead it's got people strapped inside it like your brother's first fleshlight. Finally, getting what some would call answers and I would call confusing lines of dialogue disguised as answers, we're hitting the end of the game. You do get some genuine answers here and learn about the true meaning of the game. But those genuine answers feel like when you ask your parents how babies were made and they tell you that it happened at a get together with your uncle. It just like makes things more confusing. I think they did a great job making me like Sam. He was as skeptical about the adventure as I was at the beginning and slowly he found his place within the story and saw the bigger picture. To have a game that, you know, pardon the IGN, made me feel so like the main character, it really pulled me into what they were trying to do. I don't think I've had a narrative like that before, and I'm not sure I will again. This very quickly brings me to the final chapter of the game, the chapter that sparked me to want to write this script in the first place and go through with making this video. This possibly might be one of the, like, the most heart-wrenching endings to a game I've ever played.
And for that, I can only apologize because I don't know how many jokes there will be in these final paragraphs. Other than the general joke that I thought people would find the rest of this video funny. I mean, that's got to count for something, right? I briefly mentioned that during the game, you've been traveling with a little baby. It's been strapped to your pack and you've kind of gained a little love for it. It screams and cries out your PlayStation controller. You look after it, rock it back and forth, and it's helped you against the BTs. Sam has gained a love for it after pushing old memories of his unborn baby onto it and even giving it the same name. And then it all comes full circle. Finding out that Clifford Unger was Sam's father and your baby you've been holding is just that. It's now your baby. So to find out that your baby is gone and the last chapter is to make a final delivery to the incinerator to bring it full circle from chapter one absolutely destroyed me. And talking of full circle, that's how we get back to the overarching point of the video. This video goes out to my dad, my father. This game having such an identity of the father-son relationship and realizing the weird relationship my dad has with Kojima, it just all felt so fitting by the end of it. Me and my dad have always had some issues connecting with one another as two autistic people, but as we've grown older, we've become incredibly close. The way Sam went from being a grumpy, unmotivated man to pulling in Lou close at the end after removing them from the pod. I don't know, it just resonated with me so intensely. And I can say that this may have been one of the most meaningful gaming experiences I've ever had. And that's why I wanted to make a video about it. To have that final moment of Sam saving Lou and walking off into the sunset as a better man. It's something I can only strive for in my own life. Shedding the insecurities bettering myself for the people around me, and accepting my dad's love affair with a man who makes strange games. And that's it. Death Stranding 2 will be coming out and I will be playing it. Maybe even on stream. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see. And whilst this script may not have been the magnum opus that I originally wrote and just some kind of torn up little bit of paper I found under the sofa, I'll quote a young Jackathy Blackham. Gagu gigu, fligu gigu, gagu gi. Because the original script was way better than this, and this was just a tribute. Thank you. <laughs> I do wish you were there. It was just a matter of opinion. <laughs>